Genesis chapter 10 with me, please. Genesis chapter number 10. And verse number 1. Genesis 10, 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Father, bless this word now in your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Archbishop Usher places the flood along about 2345 B.C. You can take these dates with, uh, you know, with a certain amount of uh, caution. Nobody knows exactly the date. But uh, Abraham is about 1900 B.C., so you're only looking about 300 years from the time of the flood to the time of Abraham, and you're looking at Job, which is a contemporary of Abraham, at about 1900 B.C., and there are things said in the book of Job that uh, refer directly to a flood. You also have some creatures that show up in the book of Job. Leviathan is one and Behemoth is another. These creatures show up in the Old Testament, and when you begin to run the references on them, you'll find them winding up in Revelation 13 when you have a composite beast there, which is the Antichrist coming up out of the, uh, out of the Mediterranean Sea. Then in Revelation chapter number 9, you have creatures that are part animal, part human, coming up out of the bottomless pit. And these are demons uh, and taking various forms of, uh, I don't know how you say it, where they take on physical form of a human being or part of a human being. They're supernatural creatures. And the scripture says that except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be left alive. The Bible is a strange book. The Bible deals with creatures. It talks about these creatures in a matter-of-fact way. It doesn't try to prove it. It simply states, this is the way it is, and you accept it for what it says. Here in the book of Genesis, chapter number 10, you find the three sons of Noah. Noah was the one that God used to transfer from the old world into the new world. He gave a prophecy of all three of his sons. Shem would be the one through the Messiah, the tents of Shem, that they would worship the God of Shem. Japheth would be spread out, and Ham is the one who saw the nakedness of his father. Because he'd been blessed, he couldn't be cursed, but his son was. Cursed be Canaan. And then we have Nimrod that shows up in the book of Genesis, chapter number 10. This is what's called the table of the nations. This is important. This is important because this is one of those uh, places in the Bible that... Uh, begins to establish a, a mile marker, you might say, the Romans used to use, a mile marker, the table of the nations. Where did we come from? And you'll find one showing up here in the table of the nations in verse number six. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayam, Phut, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And note verse 8 is important. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And then what follows is his kingdom. Now Nimrod shows up in far more places than just the Bible. And he shows up with varying names. This is one of the things you've got to consider when you do references and uh, check into the uh, source material about one. Nimrod, from all intent and purpose, is the first one who led a worldwide rebellion against God. And it was Nimrod who was the founder of the Tower of Babel. And it was Nimrod where God, uh, it was at Nimrod and Babel where God confounded their languages and they all came from this one place. Now there's an awful lot of tradition and legend as it relates to Nimrod. This is something you need to keep in mind. Because when you started the Bible, you'll find out that there are detractors out there that hate your Bible. And they believe the Bible is a product of evolution, just like everything else, and that it evolved into what you have today, that it's really not the inspired Word of God. When a young man or young woman goes off to a college, most of the time they'll get what's called comparative religions. Comparative religions, what's that? What they try to tell you is that the pagan religions that existed at the time of the writing of the scripture uh, are the source material for the stories in the Bible that the Jews who wrote the Bible simply accommodated these stories and respun them to suit the narrative that they were creating for you in the Bible. 
And so comparative religion borrows from all of the religions around. And let me tell you something. It can get very deep and very heady to get into all of this. I don't know if a work has ever been made where the comparative religions have been compared with the inspired scripture and to show you how that the lie that they're trying to propagate to people is indeed a lie and that the scripture is inspired of God. You see, there's no proof of any of the stuff that they charge the Bible with uh, about with these comparative religions. Let me explain what I'm talking about. How many have ever heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh? All right, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It dates back to the time of Acadia. It goes back into the, into the Babylonian uh, uh, cuneiforms and to the Sumerian. It goes back into an ancient language and an ancient civilization in, what, in a place that's called Mesopotamia. And Gilgamesh has some parallel to the story in the Bible. There is some parallel to it. But the fact of the matter is that does not, that does not in no way proves that the story of Noah and, uh, and what happened in Genesis 6 came from the same source. What it does prove is that there was a common knowledge in those days of some things that did happen and through their own culture they tried to explain them. But here's the problem now when you get into the pagan cultures. They all spin it their own way. And most of the pagan cultures when they have a god or a goddess, that god or a goddess is, uh, is their god or their goddess and they rename it for their culture. Are you following me? It's important to understand these things because a lot of young people have gone off to college believing their Bible and then when they have a few years of comparative religion, they come out an agnostic or an atheist because they've torn their Bible all to pieces. Now there's another avenue they use and I mentioned it the other day and it's called the documentary hypothesis. What's that? The documentary hypothesis is say for example is more theological than, 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 uh, than the comparative religion. The documentary hypothesis has to do with the source material of scripture itself and the doctrines of the Bible. The documentary hypothesis uh, essentially had most of its birth in Germany in the 1800s. It teaches that the book of Genesis, for example, was written by three, four, five, six, seven different people. And they have a Jehovistic here, they got an H here and a J there and this and that and this and that and this and that. But there's no proof for any of it. But the bottom line is that they try to teach a young man that the Bible itself is not a source to itself of inspired scripture from the mind of God to Moses. That the Bible itself is a compilation compiled by other religions around there and once again they create their own Bible, their own scripture and, and they teach that, 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 the, that the Jew did that. Now that's called the documentary hypothesis. You, would be, you wouldn't believe how many Bible colleges of mainstream denominations in this country teach that to the young men when they come in there and begin to study the Bible. They teach them right off the bat that they can forget the doctrine of inspiration, that to the Bible is no longer the inspired word of God. The scripture itself says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? And over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And when the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, he quoted the Old Testament scriptures, quoted the prophets, and quoted them as if every word they said was true. So the documentary hypothesis, of course, is a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. There's no basis in fact to it. But you get a double whammy of that. You get comparative religion and the documentary hypothesis, and you go off to a Bible, off to a university like UT or someplace like that, and you get, and you get that for two or three years, it's a thousand wonders you believe in anything by the time you're done with it. And so the per point is, it's my job as the pastor of the church that watches for your souls, that teaches and preaches the word of God, to be on the lookout for that and try to give you something to help you on the way. For example, Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz, uh, the uh, queen of heaven. I've already mentioned the epic of Gilgamesh. These are only a few of the characters that are mentioned either in scripture or in secular authority. For example, turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter number eight and verse number 14. Ezekiel eight fourteen. The book of Ezekiel. Now remember when you read the prophets, prophets fall into three categories, pre-exile, exile, and post-exile, after the exile. So we have Ezekiel, who was written during the exile, 
And so here we have the, uh, you have the sovereignty of God. God's still God even though Israel's not in their land. Look at chapter 8, verse 14 of the book of Ezekiel. He said in verse 13, said unto me, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women doing what? Weeping for Tammuz. All right, of course, first thing you do, who's Tammuz? Well, you get in there and begin to do a little research on it. You'll find out it depends on who's talking. It depends on what source you're dealing with. It depends on what authority you have. Tammuz generally, according to Hislop and his two Babylons, teaches that Nimrod's mother was Semiramis. And his mother, uh, being Semiramis, that obviously being born, he had an incestuous relationship with her, and Tammuz was born. Tammuz died, uh, depending on who you're reading, a number of different ways, but he wound up dying and going down into the center of the heart of the earth and then coming up, rising up. So here we have a mimicking of the resurrection. So here we have, remember, comparative religions. They'll come along and tell you, you see, how that by preaching the resurrection of Christ, it's nothing in the world more than your spin on an ancient story about Tammuz. Now, this is a, this is a study in itself. I just skimmed the surface with you tonight. But let me say this. So there'll be no misunderstanding. I believe this Bible was given to Moses and I believe he received it by inspiration of God. And I believe about 1,400 years before Christ, he wrote the scripture. God told him to write a book. And I believe that what you have here is the word of God. Now, what that means is that the Bible takes its priority, it takes precedent over any pagan spinning of what goes on inside the Bible. Scripture mentions the queen of heaven. But the queen of heaven can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people outside the Bible. The queen of heaven existed, absolutely, in the sense that existed in history and all of that. So how many of you followed me so far at this point? All right. I mean, I, I didn't get any of that when I first got saved. Now, so you're, looking at, uh, you're looking at decades of digging and study and, and trying to understand and asking God for wisdom uh, when we get into his word. So we start now with Nimrod in Genesis 10 and the Gentile kingdoms. All right, that's important. The Gentile kingdoms. But the times of the Gentiles, when does that start? When does the times of the Gentiles start? It doesn't start with Nimrod. Who? Exactly, that's the date in what kingdom? Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, thou art that head of gold. The Lord told Nebuchadnezzar that. All right, so you have you have successive Gentile kingdoms that fulfill the prophecy of this image in the plains of Dura that started in 606 BC and finishes, that finishes when a stone cut out of a mountain. The mountain represents a kingdom and the stone smites the image on its feet. So therefore one kingdom destroys another kingdom and it smites the image on its feet and its destruction is absolute and complete. It is never built, rebuilt, it never exists again. And that kingdom is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to look at something. Look at chapter number 4 of Luke and verse number 5. So when the Lord showed up 2,000 years ago, he came offering a kingdom to Israel. In Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 5. Notice carefully now, because this you have to put this together right or we get in trouble. Now look, Luke chapter number four and verse five. The devil taketh him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What's that mean? That means future? You said all the kingdoms of the world. Does it mean all the kingdoms of the world that existed at that time or all the kingdoms of the world that were under his domain? I believe the latter. I believe Satan was able to show him in a moment of time past present and future, which in itself opens up a huge new study because now we're dealing with time travel, right? You remember in the book of Revelation when John was caught up in the spirit on the Lord's day? The Bible says it was what, not what was told him, it was what he saw. He looked down upon the earth and he saw the Antichrist and all that happened. What did he do? He saw something that happened 
2,000 years later. But in any event, what we have here in Luke chapter number 4 is uh, Satan offering Christ the kingdom. Well, now, he, look, at, look, how, look what he says here in verse number 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for, watch this, that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Is this a vain boast, or is this a, boast, is this, is this a statement of reality? It's a statement of reality. He could do it. And the truth of the matter is, that's how he sucks men and women in today, by offering them power and authority. And it's not a vain thing. And you'd be surprised at how many multi-millionaire performers say, yes, I made a league with Satan. I made a league with Satan. He kept his end of the bargain. Now I'm rich. Problem is, it's going to take you to a place your money's worth nothing. That's the problem. What should it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Amen. Don't make any leagues with the devil. The Lord Jesus told him plainly what to do. Get thee behind me, Satan. But now look at Matthew chapter number 10, verse 5. He offered him the kingdoms of the world. The Lord Jesus comes offering a kingdom to the Jewish people. In Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 5, he said in verse number 5, These twelve he sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Now hold on. How does this figure in with the Great Commission? See, this is the way to study the Bible. This is the way to study it. What appears to be a, a contradiction, right? <coughs> it is no contradiction. You know me better than that. I believe this book from cover to cover. The only contradictions around are those in my head when I can't <laughs> figure something out. But here's, here's the bottom line. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, any city of the Samaritans. Yet on the other hand, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So what's happened between the two? This is how you study the Bible. If you can figure out what happened between the two statements, then you've got a hold of what's going on in the New Testament. See what I mean? And that's, that's where Bible study comes in. That's where the scripture is important. It's important, very important. And so well, what, he what we have here is the offering of the kingdom. But the kingdom is only offered to the Jews. And when he gives the Sermon on the Mount, it's to the Jews. And the kingdom of heaven, which Matthew preaches over and over and over and over again, is offered to the Jews. But what happens? Well, the Jews reject it because they reject him. Look at the book of Matthew, chapter number 12 and verse number 14. Matthew 12, 14. And I'll try to move through these as quickly as I can. Then the Pharisees went out, held a council against him, how they, what, might destroy him. Look at verse number 24. Here's how they did it. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. See this? So they say he's illegitimate, born of Ben Pantera, and now they're saying that he's demon-possessed and that everything he does is a magical trick. It's magic. He's calling upon the powers of darkness to do what he does. So you don't demonize someone any worse than that, right? The point is they're going to demonize him in the eyes of the people. Well, look at chapter number 13 now of the book of Matthew. Now watch how it develops. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 1. Same day Jesus went out of the house, sat by the sea, uh, seaside. Great multitudes gathered together to him. So when he went into the ship, sat, and the whole multitude stood, and he spake to them things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. The parable shows up once they have demonized him, once they have, once they have said he's illegitimate. We be not for, born of fornication, they said to him, to his face. And so they've demonized him, and they've rejected him, and they're the leaders of Israel. And so now here we have them, here, here the scripture says that uh, they, he begins to speak unto them in parables. Why the parable? There's a reason for the parable. It's very important. Why? Because he said, it's given unto you, the Jews, his, his, his hand-picked disciples, to understand what I'm teaching through these parables, but not unto them. Why not? Because they had rejected the truth. He knew they wouldn't receive it. And so he's in his mercy and his graciousness. He blinds them and quotes Isaiah chapter number 6. In hearing you hear not, seeing you see not, and all of that. Now, folks, you would be surprised 
at how many churches all over this country have never heard anything like I just gave you. They've never heard it. All you'll ever hear out of most of them, well, a parable is, a, is, a, is an earthly message with a heavenly meaning. Well, that's all sweet and nice and sounds good. But now tell me again, what's the parable for? <laughs> when did it show up? What was the purpose of it? This is what I'm trying to give you tonight. And there was a reason for it. There was a reason for when it came. And there's a reason for it in the scripture. And according to the word of God, God did exactly what he intended to do with the parable. Chapter number 13, verses 13 through 16 of the book of Matthew. Look at this. Therefore speak I unto them in parables, because seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand them as fulfill the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and so forth and so on. And uh, then he quotes that scripture. Now I would recommend to you tonight that if you want to get a deeper study of this, the best I've ever seen, fact is it's the only one that I've ever seen that really opens this up, is Ethelbert Bullinger's companion Bible on, on, on Isaiah chapter number six. He'll show you everywhere that scripture is quoted in the New Testament. He'll show, it how, show you how it's applied. He'll show you when, how, why, and where God blinded the Jew and how we wind up in Romans chapter number 11. Ethelbert Bullinger. The Companion Bible, Isaiah chapter number 6. And uh, that's, that's a gold mine to understand the scriptures. So the kingdom of heaven is held in abeyance because no one's qualified. The kingdom of heaven was not received. And some teach, and good people, I've got good people I love and have the greatest respect for, that teach that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God are identical. One and the same. No, they're not. I don't believe that. But you know, I don't fall out of fellowship with some brother because he does because he believes they are. You know, there are places where we can we can love each other and fellowship with each other. I don't send somebody to hell just because he doesn't agree with what I teach. There's a bunch of them out there that do, boy. I mean, you run, you walk with the wrong crowd. You you make the big mistake of eating breakfast with the wrong bunch. You're going to the pit. Can you can you imagine a crowd like that? I better check my list, make sure I, I can eat with whoever I'm going to eat with. But anyway, the kingdom of God shows up in John 3. Now look at this. I'll show you where the difference comes in. John chapter number 3. Now so far we've started with the times of the Gentiles, with Nimrod, with pagan religions, and, and with uh, 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 comparative religions, and with the documentary hypothesis. I've given you a lot of stuff tonight, but you can also get the tape and go back through it and, and, and listen to it. I wish I'd have had that when I first got saved. But, but you can go back through it and you can listen to it. In John chapter number 3 and verse number 3, the Lord answered and said unto him, And verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. How many caught me? Oh, good. You're keeping up with me. What's it say? Kingdom of God. Now notice carefully. Kingdom of God. Verse number 5. Verily, I say to thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now we'll go a little further with it and let the Bible define itself. Look at the book of Acts, chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Acts 1, 3. Acts 1, 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Now what are we talking about passion? How many would know what that's talking about? The passion of Christ. That has to do with his death, his burial. It ha really, it has to do with Gethsemane and all that led up to it and through the high priest and then finally his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection. All right, now look at this. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Some of the new Bibles use the word convincing proofs. Which one is stronger, infallible or convincing? No question about it. <laughs> uh, it seen of them 40 days, now watch this, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, long after the kingdom of heaven had been set into abeyance, all right, and the eyes were blinded, and he was now preaching the gospel to the Gentile. No, it's not the kingdom of heaven anymore. The kingdom of God is still going strong. See what I mean? If they're one and the same and identical, what do we got happening here? Absolutely. Now, I want you to look again with me the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 25. 
Acts chapter number 20, verse number 25. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts 20, 25. And, uh, <coughs> and now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching <coughs> the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So it's clear the Apostle Paul says, I have been preaching the kingdom of God. And so who his, who, what did God tell Ananias when he, when he saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus? He told Ananias that Saul was something special. You remember what he told him? Exactly. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name to the Gentiles. All right. So he's a minister to the Gentiles. He's preaching the kingdom of God. No question about that. And then look at Acts chapter number 28, verse 23. Acts 23, and when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded, testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets, from morning till evening, some believed the things which were spoken, some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Now here we go. He quotes Isaiah 6 again. At every every inflection point, every place of dire consequences where choices are made. He says, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Hear ye shall hear, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you. That salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Now wait a minute. Had any Gentiles been saved before this? Yes. So what's he saying? He says this is an official declaration of the focus of the ministry from henceforth. It is to the Gentiles. Jews can be saved, absolutely. But the main focus of the ministry now, the preaching of the gospel, is to Gentiles. And he said, they'll hear it. He said, these words the Jews departed had great reasoning among themselves. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the times of the Gentiles, these are heavy hitters. These are the kind of things, if you can get them lined up right in your Bible, the rest of the book will begin to take shape for you. So now what's the next one? Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 18. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew 16, 18. I'd have this mark, but I ran out of markers. You think a cheap skate like me to have a few markers, good night. Matthew 16, 18. Peter, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Greek word translated church, you probably heard it a thousand times, is ecclesia. It means a called out assembly. It could be a bunch of drunks out in the street as you're uh, 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 screaming and yelling as you find the book of Acts. There's nothing holy about the word church or ecclesia in Greek, but it is a called out assembly. So by our nature, we have been called out from this world. We've been called and separated unto God. That's what the church is. And notice what he says. He says, I'll build my church. So what is the church? Well, the church is the body of Christ. It's the body of believers being built during the times of the Gentiles. Now you've got an election coming up, November the 5th. I managed to get over there Monday and cast my ballot. Anybody want to know who I voted for? I ain't telling you. <laughs> But I got in there, and I, we didn't have to stand in line long and cast my ballot. And this coming Tuesday, the 5th of November, is going to be the day that uh, America officially, uh, uh, you know, casts its ballot. It's going to elect uh, either a, a Democrat or Republican as the president of this nation. Uh, what, that, what does that mean, preacher? It means big changes are coming. Either way, big changes are coming. That's what it means, Okay. And so are these big changes in the church? No, church has nothing to do with it. These are big changes in that times of the Gentiles. 
You need to understand that. You need to get it lined out what it is. It's the times of the Gentiles. The United States of America is part of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles that started in 606 B.C. All right? Not a perfect nation. Been a lot of good things about it. I've been here a while. I know a little bit about the country. And uh, we enjoyed a lot of freedoms. Uh, I'm afraid that we took a lot of them for granted. Such a shame. We did. First Amendment's important. The people out here who print newspapers and get on TV and NBC, CBS, and ABC, you know, they enjoy the benefits of the First Amendment because that's what they do. They speak, you see. But they don't want you to enjoy the benefits of the First Amendment. So this is where the cancel culture comes in, you know, and this is where hate speech comes in, and this is where anything else that they can create to control what you say, kick you off of social media, not allow you to speak on certain social media sites, is that not a form of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, what's the word for it? That's it, censorship. Is that not a form of censorship? Of course it is. And uh, I believe in freedom of speech. I do. And I've said a thousand times, if you lose the freedom of speech, none of the rest of them really matter because you're a slave from then on. And so that was the first amendment to the Constitution. So keep in mind that regardless of what happens Tuesday, whether a Democrat or Republican goes into office, it's not going to change the church of God, and it's not going to change the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles will run its course, and the church of God is not being built at the election ballot. The church of God is built by the hand of the Son of God himself. Every one of you are stones cut out and placed inside that wall, and he cut you and shaped you before he ever brought you to the wall. Think about that. That's for the old, the old Testament, that's what happened. You talk about a master. You, you talk about a master builder. Imagine somebody who could cut a stone and knew exactly the dimensions and what it, what it took for it to fit into that wall. He didn't, he didn't bring it over to the wall and trim it and cut it to make it fit into the temple we're talking about now, Solomon's temple. He did that back where it was quarried. Now, that's a master mason, folks, and that, of course, is what the Lord does because that's, he's a type of that. When he cut me out, he knew where he was going to put me, and he had a place waiting for me, and he stuck me in there, and he looked at the rest of them, and he said, I dare you say a word about it. Amen. Because <laughs> he's called. Amen. So the church, I'm glad, thank God, I'm a member of the church of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. This is one of those passages in the Bible that, uh, that once, you, once you get a hold of it, you love it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the what? Church of God. These are three distinct entities. Distinct. Jew, Gentile, Church of God. So what you, what, which one are you, preacher? I'm a Gentile. But what overshadows that, that is far more important than that, is that in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. And the scripture says in the book of Ephesians, He hath made of twain, which is Jew and Gentile, one new man. So when it comes to the body of Christ, we don't identify uh, with, a, with secular identity. You know, like it puts us in some category inside the body of Christ. We're all the same. If you're born of the Spirit of God tonight, God sees one person in his body, and that's it. And, you're, and you are, and you are, and you are uh, accepted in the beloved. Amen. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad we don't have to try to chop up and, 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 <laughs> and separate and segregate and this and that and this and that when it comes to the body of Christ. If you love our Lord Jesus Christ and you're born again, you're my brother and you're my sister in Christ as far as it goes. Amen. Amen. And I'm happy with it. Well, that's the body of Christ. See, that's, that's what we have. And, and this is one of the things that pulls us together. It's that fellowship we have one with another. Because when we look at each other, we know we have been accepted by Christ. Christ put us where we are. We're born of the Spirit of God. We have one Father. We have the same Spirit residing inside us. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Glory to God. And nothing's going to change that. Amen. Amen. We belong to Him. And He belongs to us. And this is what, and this is this is this is the way it ought to be, and it's the way it is. So I'm I'm a member of the Church of God. I used to be a Gentile. 
but I'm a son of God now. And we have Jewish brethren in here. They used to be Jews, but now they're sons of God. And this is why I have a problem with anybody, and I don't care how well-meaning they are, which try to drag in the Jewish law or Jewish feast days. It's all good to study that stuff. That's fine. We'll do that and understand its relationship to the truth of the New Testament. But do not drag that stuff in and try to apply that to somebody and tell them it's necessary for their walk with God. No, it is not. Christ is the end of the law for everyone that believeth. He fulfills every demand and command of Scripture. They're wound up and fulfilled in Him. Amen. I respect these things. I certainly do. I respect them. And, but no, I am not bound to them, not at all. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Bless it tonight. Bless these dear folk who've come out to hear it. Lord, give us understanding in the scriptures. You said you would, and I believe that with all my heart. Bless them with a the sweet Holy Ghost. May we have fellowship one with another. May we not see each other as Americans, or may not see each other racially, or see each other in any other context, but see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord, draw nigh to thee, and you'll draw nigh to us. In thy holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sabrina Martin. You want to sing for us? They give an invitation. <laughs>